Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants are in a listen only mode for the duration of today's conference. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Yara McSweeney. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Psychology of Mapping Census Data. My name is Yara McSweeney, and I am a program analyst here at the Census Bureau. I want to thank you for joining us today at the Back to the Data Basics webinar series. This webinar series was created by the Census Academy team here at the Census Bureau. You can register for any of the webinars by visiting census.gov slash academy. Before I introduce today's speaker, let's just go over a few housekeeping items. As I mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded. For your convenience, it will be posted to our Census Academy site within 30 business days. We'll post all supplemental materials, including the PowerPoint slides. In terms of how to ask the questions during the webinar, you can submit your written questions using the Q&A panel, which is at the bottom center or the right side of your WebEx screen. Please take a moment to locate that now. Once you've found the Q&A panel, make sure you choose all panelists from the drop-down menu. This will ensure we see your question. Also, we ask that you do not include any personal or business identifiable information with your questions. My colleagues, Noemi Mendez and Carol Miller, will be monitoring the Q&A panel, and as time allows, they will answer your questions directly to the Q&A panel, or they will read them out loud to our presenter after his presentation. For any questions that are not answered, feel free to contact us at the contact information we'll provide later. Now let's talk about the chat panel. Look for it right next to the Q&A panel. Keep that channel open because this is where we will provide you helpful links and other resources. Keep in mind, you won't be able to respond to the chat. Chat is just for us to send you links, including our evaluation. As you know, we are in a virtual environment and sometimes technical difficulties might occur. If you are having issues, try a different browser or consider logging out and coming back into the session. Lastly, throughout the webinar, a link where you could tell us uh, how we did today will be provided in the chat. We are very interested in hearing how we're doing. Okay, so now with all of those administrative items out of the way, I now like to introduce today's speaker, David Craker. Thanks again for being here, David. The floor is yours. Oh, uh, thanks, Yara. I just want to make sure, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Wow, you, you did cover a lot there. I, I feel like I don't have to say anything, but uh, once again, I'm just going to say thank you uh, for joining our Back to Data Basics webinar series, and today's title is right here in front of you, The Psychology of Mapping uh, Census Bureau Data. Um, once again, my name is David Craker, and I'm uh, I've been at Census Bureau for uh, almost 25 years, actually. Uh, first, I worked as a geographer in the New York Regional Office, and then uh, after that, uh, I sort of progressed into being a data dissemination specialist. That's a long title. Um, and so I am one of the many data dissemination specialists available across the country. Uh, we do conduct trainings and presentations, workshops, and we respond to uh, data inquiries from uh, data users. Uh, I actually cover the area of New York State and New Jersey State, and every once in a while I, I'm assigned uh, New England as well. So to actually uh, learn about who the specialists are in your area, you know, you should contact us at the website, or not website, but the uh, email address, census.askdata at census.gov. And let me say that again, census.askdata at census.gov. And um, you can ask your questions there. We were, we were also going to, we will, or I will, put this uh, contact information at the end of the presentation as well. Um, we also uh, urge you to uh, go to what we call Census Academy uh, if you want to learn more about our services or actually look at our data gems or the courses or the videos that we have there. And the easiest thing you can do is just Google Census Academy and it will bring you to that site. So. My webinar will last uh, less than one hour, 
and uh, at the end, uh, there will be some time to um, take a few of your questions. So let me just move into the webinar now and um, just what we're going to talk about today, what we're going to do, our lesson. So I'm actually going to go through a, a little bit about mapping types, quantitative approaches, uh, classification types, effective use of color, and then um, actually a little bit about census geographies. And then what I'm going to do is go out of this uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation and actually go into our uh, website, data.census.gov, and uh, sort of demonstrate how you can uh, get data from there and actually map if you need to, uh, map, map using our system. So let me just go ahead and start this right away and, and go into uh, different mapping types. So there is such a thing as uh, qualitative or quantitative. Um, and so here's an example of a qualitative map. A qualitative map are sort of the, those very traditional, one example, those very traditional maps that we used to see on the walls in, in classrooms where every country was colored a different, had a different color. Um, it's really just to show differences in kind. It's the same kind of thing, but we just want to see where one transitions into another. Qualitative is also uh, nominal data, so something that's named. And actually, there's actually not much focus on quantity. Sometimes there is, but in general, it's not a focus on differences in quantity. Um, by the way, as I go through this uh, PowerPoint, I do like to quote the sources down here. If I took images or got information from them, you are going to see that I've put the source right here in the slide. But I also have a whole list of them at the very end of the presentation. So that was qualitative, right? But what is quantitative? So quantitative actually shows magnitude. So this is one of our maps that comes from data.census.gov. It shows the differences in numbers. So how you're going from like a low number to a high number where there's more of something or less of something in an area. Uh, it is a, a good way to map statistics. Um, and I, I do want to say that rates and statistics um, percentages probably work better for quantitative um, mapping than numbers do. But even though I'm saying that right now, you're going to see as I give presentations that, that it's not always true, that maybe sometimes you just want that numeric value, that straight numeric value, and that might actually get you the answer that you need. So um, we'll keep that in mind as we look at the maps later on. Uh, what is a choropleth map? And so I, I feel that this is something we need to think about as we go into this. It is a type of thematic map. And a uh, choropleth map, um, usually you're going to be using administra administrative or administration and statistical areas to fill it in with the data that you want to um, depict, we'll say, right? And color is the principal symbol. Okay, so the color is re representing either statistics or numbers or your areas of interest, that sort of thing. And notice this is a map of people of Irish ancestry around the United States, right? So it is, once again, it is a um, quantitative map. It's showing you how much there is of each thing. You can tell this by the legend here, um, the percentage within each. I think this, these are counties around the United States. So that's just a good example, but once again, this is also called a core plus map. It is a type of map. So I like to start this by saying in the good old days. Okay, so in the good old days, remember people always say in the good old days, uh, we variables are visualized differently. And so look at the map on the right, which is, you know, pretty hard to look at. In the good old days, we didn't have color printing. There wasn't, a, it was expensive. And so people avoided color printing and they made maps like what you see on the right, okay? And this was um, a type of map that would show you uh, information, you know, beginning at zero, moving up to whatever the magnitude was. Uh, in this case, it's motor vehicle death rates in California. Um, and so look how difficult it was to look at this map. But if you look on the left, the map is rather intuitive. You can see where there is more of something, right? So right here we see a motor vehicle death rate in California, right? And we can see that we have uh, lower numbers and then higher numbers as you move forward. But it, once again, it is intuitive uh, just with the color there, the, the, uh, the density 
of the color. Oh, sorry about that. Let me just move forward here. And I want to make sure does everyone can still see my slideshow, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's think about this. What will we what will we map? You know, will we map percentage? Will we map rate? Will we map number? And how is that going to change the look at your, of your map, right? So right here um, on the left, right, we have the motor vehicle deaths, right? And in this case, we are mapping the number of deaths in California by county. And so notice this county down at the bottom, Los, I believe that's Los Angeles County, Los Angeles area anyway, that's really dark and has a high number of deaths. Um, well, of course it does. There are 10 million people living in that county. So it, it's in just a huge population. So you will have more deaths, right? But if we change this to be what we have on the right here, and this is um, a rate map, right? Um, vehicle death rate, we're going to get something totally different. And what we will see that is actually a low vehicle death rate per number of people living there. And in fact, it's the more rural counties that have that have higher uh, death rates. So the way you depict something, whether it's a, a pure number or whether you're using a rate or percentage, will change the way your map looks. Okay, and then also the number of data classes you choose, right, will uh, affect your map as well. So look at the, the number of data classes on the right. There's just a whole permeation of these, so many of them, but it, it is really hard to match the color that you're looking at in the legend to what's on the map if you get too many data classes. And so what you want to probably do is have somewhere between four to six data classes, right? And so in this case, on the left, we have five data classes. That's sort of the, the default for census mapping uh, when we're using our, our um, data tools. But, you know, you could do a little bit more, a little bit less. But if you get too many, it's going to make it quite difficult um, using this map. So here we have uh, an example. We have four data classes, right, and then six, and then 11. And it will change the way the map looks. Um, if you want just a generalization, you know, to kind of figure out where you have more and less of something, maybe that map on the right works okay. But if you do have to refer back to your legends, um, you're probably not going to want that many data classes, just too many permeations of the same hue or color, and people can't perceive that. Okay, so let's talk about how we are going to classify things when we're mapping. Uh, there are different ways of creating mapping classifications, and in this case, this is the very traditional equal interval. Okay, so if we look over here on the right, the, very, the upper right, we see the percentage under population under five, right? And so we have three to six, six to nine, nine to 12. And so that's, um, you know, a very uh, normal way of mapping in a way that people can relate to the data in the legend. But look at the map on the left, and you can see that really it's, it's kind of a boring looking map. You're not really uh, getting something out of this map. Um, you, you probably want to get a little bit more. And so um, there is something down here at the bottom. It is called a histogram. And this is the way cartographers, um, and I used to have to do this many moons ago before we had computers, do it plotted out by hand. Uh, figuring out how many instances we have of something and how we're going to break that map up and depict that map. So equal interval um, we, is really equal size subrange. So we saw that, right? It's easy for inter interpretation, but the clustered values sometimes clustered into one, they are all clustered into one class and it gives you kind of a boring map to look at, but a map that doesn't really help you either. But let's move on and think about another way to look at things. So this is what's called the quantiles method. Um, and this is where actually equal number of features are in a class, okay? So it isn't exactly totally equal numbers, but it's as close as the mechanism can get. And so we're going to say, you know, if, if we had, you know, 100 of something, we divide into the first quarter, the second quarter, the you know, third and the fourth quarter. But in this 
case it's divided into five groups, so 20%, 40%, 60%. Uh, it stresses the relative position of something, but um, as you look at the histogram, you see that things that are similar sometimes may end up in different classes, even though they're very, very close to each other. This is something you know a lot of journalists like to use. You'll hear them say they, it was in the top um, top quantile, and you know what does that mean? Okay, so uh, but it, it could be useful depending on what you want to depict or what you want to get out of the map. So here's another method, and this is the method that is our default system in our uh, mapping application, and this is called natural breaks. And so if we look down here at the histogram. We're going to see that things are sort of classed together in, um, what, as they are, but it's going to get severed at different places by natural grouping, okay? So where we have little spikes and peaks and valleys and things like that where you think, see things change, it's, it's going to divide it that way. It's sort of natural grouping. It is a good, a good way to map things, and it gives more a, a clearer picture of um, patterns on the map that, that we may need to see in order to analyze something. And then over here on the right, we do have our legend. So the legend isn't quite um, as tidy as it would be in the uh, equal interval. But here we have three to six, six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, and then look at this last one, 10 to 18, okay? But in any case, it is a, a, a nice way to map. But you need to keep in mind that if you are making many different maps and you're using natural breaks method, it does make it difficult sometimes to um, compare those maps together, certainly because you have different types of variables and, and different rates within those. So, um, so how can we make a coreplex map effective? Uh, one thing is, like I just said, one variable at a time. So you have, you, it is really recommended that you map one variable at a time. If you start putting too many layers of color, you won't have color, you'll have gray. Okay, color, many colors over each other just turn into gray. So that's probably not going to work for you. You need to um, sort of use relative data, how it, it, it relates one, you know, the thing is all the same thing and it relates to each other. Use the right color scheme, okay? So you want a color that's sort of similar in hue and it goes from light to dark, and that is an intuitive way, um, psychologically really, saying, okay, where I have a darker color the, of the same hue, right, I know that I have more of something or more of a problem area. Okay, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a higher number, it just might mean it's more of uh, the targeted area that I need to analyze. So, uh, once again, to make it intuitive, have the right color scheme, keep it all relative, and just work on one variable at a time. So I do want to give you a little, um, I call census geographies in a nutshell. I'm actually going to work my way uh, up, up the uh, ladder here, so starting at the, the right. This is how the Census Bureau um, puts together many of their geographies, certainly for those decennial geographies, but not everything, we, we have some uh, outliers here are, are thing more creative ways of depicting data, but this is actually, um, we start at the block level every 10 years, we renumber blocks around the country. The blocks are then uh, within a block group, block groups within a um, tract, and tracts are sort of like our showcase geography. We have them all around the country, usually about 4,000 people in the tract. Um, then the tracts are within counties, but notice that they are not, they do not nest within cities, okay? They nest within counties, the counties nest within the state, the state within the United States. And then up here at the right, I've just put a few of the other geographies. These are things that don't really fall into this tidy nesting scheme, but for which we do have uh, data that are available. Okay, so before I move on, to uh, data.census.gov. I did want to put this up here. This is the time. Um, I'm sure you can get this PowerPoint. It will be posted later on, but if you wanted just to see, you know, where you're going, what my email address is and what the ask data email address is, this is it up here. And these are my references. I, I do want to say uh, Pennsylvania State University had some great images that I used. And one thing I did not go into is something called Color Brewer. 
is listed right here, colorbrewer2.org. I really do recommend that to figure out um, the hues and colors that you might want to use if you're mapping. Let me just move on to the next slide. These are what we're going to look at today. I just want you to know I've put references to my data set uh, up here so that we can actually uh, get back to them and you can use them later on. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and then I am going to share my screen again and we're going to go explore data. So I just want to make sure that somebody, somebody let me know, somebody yell out something that you can see me or that you can see my website. Okay, uh, I'm going to say yes. I, I think you can see it. Okay, so the, the how we're going to get here today is actually you're going to you would go to and you don't have to follow. You can just watch, sit back and watch, break out your popcorn. Um, you don't have to really follow along because I might be going a little bit fast. But this is actually our website that we call data.census.gov. This is not the Census Bureau's main website. This is actually where we house much of our, da our data, for example, ACS and the uh, 2020 uh, decennial data. So I always like to say the secret of this, the secret of starting here is to come down here to advanced search. And you click on advanced search, and then that opens these filters for you. So what I really recommend, believe it or not, as a geographer, is that you do not start with your geography. Okay, I recommend that you start with the year. Filter it by year. Okay, and so right now, 2020 data is out there for decennial, and it is out there for uh, American Community Survey. So I'm going to click on 2020. So get your year out of the way first. Okay, and then you can come down here and you can do a couple of different things. Okay, you can come to geography first, or you can come to your survey first. In this case, I'm just working my way up the ladder. I'm going to go to American Community Survey. I say I want the five-year estimates. And today we're going to look at data profiles. So I click on that. And notice every time I work through this over here, I have filters. The filters sort of pop up here, and that is what I'm working with. Okay, if you need to get rid of something or change it, you're going to X on, exit out right here. There's a tiny, tiny X. You will X that out, and then you can sort of start over and change what you're working on. But let me go to geographies, and for what we're working on today, for, for the first demonstration, I'm actually going to go into counties, okay? And once you do that, you have to sort of work your way down, right? And I'm going to go to New York State. And here it is right here, New York State. And I say, I want all counties in New York State. So I've done that. These are my filters over here. And then over here on the right, lower right, there's a little button and it says search. And I click on search. And then it sort of works through this right here. And now I have four tables that are available in 2020. And remember, I said I wanted what we call the five-year data profiles, okay? So they are here, and I'm going to click on uh, the table that's called DP05, just as a demonstration. So what happens here, it lets you see the table. Okay, so over here on the right is the table for all the counties in New York State. And uh, you could actually, if you were working in here, you can flip back and forth between the tables that are right here in your results. So there's four. Sometimes there will be hun like 100. Okay, but you can flip back and forth through them, and the table will appear over here on the right. Let me close these chevrons up here, and I'll make the table a little bit larger. So now we see all this data that's here, and this is what's called a DPO, DPO5 table, data profile table. It just really has um, hard numbers, you know, counts. But the one thing about DP tables um, is that we have numbers in here, but we also have uh, percentages, okay? And I'm going to show you how to actually uh, map uh, both, okay? So I'm just looking through the table really quick, scrolling through, letting you see that it has information. Um, people counted, has a little bit of information about race, um, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, you know, are people citizens, right? So let me go back up here to the top. Notice what's in the table here at the left, sex and age, right? And we are going to map 
age 65 to 74. Okay, that's going to be our topic today. And what you can do here, when you get a table, and the table has to be many of something, it has to be a few of something, you can go to this button right here. If you can see right in the middle to the right slightly, click on map, and it will create a map of all the counties in New York State. Notice I'm getting a legend right here. It pops up for me. It's predetermined for me. Um, I don't know what it is mapped, but if I come over here to this button here, it says variable, and I click here, it is showing me that table again and everything that it has mapped. So if you can imagine, it maps total population. Um, but the total population, if let me just show that again, is down here. New York City is just immense in population. So of course, it will be a darker area. But let's go back to the variable. Let's change something. And let's go down to, I said, the total 60. Let me take that, 65 to 74 years old. So we're going to map the estimate right here just to see what the numbers look like. And here they are. It looks very similar to that other map because, of course, New York City has a high population, right? So it simply has more people who are age 65 to 64. But if I go back to my variable and I say, but let's look at the percentage, right, of the total population, it changes that map drastically. So now we see that people who are between the age of 65 and 74 who live in uh, New York State, upstate New York, has higher percentages of those, of those uh, population. And so over here on the left, you see the little legend, and it's actually giving you the percentages over here, the way it has broken that out, and it's giving you um, the numbers of breakouts right here. But we can actually control that a little bit, right? So we learned that in that slideshow, we can come here to the classes. There's an icon right here. And we can say, do I want five data classes? That's the default. Do I want four? Do I want six? So I'm, I'm going to just keep it at five. I can switch to quantile if I want to do that. And it breaks everything out by five classes equally. Or I can come back to classes and I can say, wait a minute, I want an equal interval because I want a legend that's easy to uh, to read. Notice how it changes everything over here. And I, I want to say there is um, there is some usefulness, usefulness in this. It has isolated one county, right, that has the highest percentage of people between 65 and 74 years old. So I find that that could be quite useful. I'm, I'm actually going to go back just to natural breaks right here, put it like that. And one other thing, if you are in our, um, our application here, our data tool, you have the ability to, to manipulate the colors. Um, so it's right here. And I didn't talk about that too much, but here's a color, color ramp, right? Um, and it's called a sequential ramp. It's going from a light to dark hue or dark color, right? And then down here, there's a diverging color ramp. You don't want to use a diverging color ramp for this. You're basically going from zero to the highest number. If you had a number that went from zero, you had positive and negative, and zero could be right in the middle, then you would use that diverging ramp. Here are those qualitative colors down here. They're all just different colors indicating where different counties are. You don't want that either because you are mapping uh, quantitative data. So we can change our color scheme right here, and we can make it less transparent. My, my daughter always likes to say, you need those colors to pop so that you can really see what is going on. And so here you have um, an example of something you may create. You may want to do this before you pull it into your GIS. If you zoom into our map a little bit, I believe you start to see some extra information like maybe the county name. And you can simply take this little hand, you can click on the county like that, and it will give you the percentage if you wanted to, to go that route, okay? So that is, that is one example. I'm actually going to um, go back over here to the left to my filters. And I'm going, going to change things just a little bit, right? So right now, 
what I want to do is I'm going to stay with the 2020 data and I'm going to stay with all the counties in New York, but I do want to add uh, more counties, okay? So I'm going to go down here to geographies and I'm going to add to that. So I'll click back on county right there and I have to click on county again. And let me see if I can get out of New York. Okay, there it is. I'm going to add New Jersey to the mix. Click on New Jersey. I say all the counties in New Jersey. So I now have two sets. I have all counties in New York, all counties in New Jersey. I still have those um, what we call data profile tables. And I'm actually going to switch a table. Okay, so I just come right here to DPO3, click on that. And I'm going to close the Chevron right here. And I, let me go back to the table. And this is, sorry, this kind of gets in the way. Go to full table. Okay, and so now we have a different table. It's selected economic characteristics. And I just want to show you what the table looks like as we go through it. Um, we have employment status, commuting to work, occupation industry that people work in, class of worker, and then their income and benefits, okay? And so we're actually going to look at something income and benefits. So here we have, um, I wanna look at median household income. So here we have actually a number, a rate, which is the amount of money people, um, the average that they, they have in that um, county. So we're going to go ahead and map that and look at that. So let me click on the map. So this is sort of uh, similar to a, a rate or, you know, it's not, um, you know, one to 10, it's actually something that's been averaged out, right? So we'll click on the variable and we actually have to work our way through this table, but I know that it's down here in income and benefits. Okay, so here we come down here and we're looking for I wanted that, yeah, here it is, uh, median household income. I actually want the number. Okay, and so here we have, let me just do this really quickly. I'm going to make this map just a little bit larger if I can. Okay, so here we have what it looks like in this area of the country. We have um, over here on the left, we have our legend. So look at the legend. It is by default, um, let me just look at that, classes. It's natural breaks. We could also make it uh, equal interval. Maybe that would isolate a few things. And it does, so we can look at look at it that way if we wanted to. Let me just, just for fun, we'll, we'll change that color. Okay, and so here we, there's a lot of things that stand out, right? The, the medium household income, believe it or not, it is not in New York City. It is not Manhattan, right? There's Manhattan right there, but look at these counties surrounding. They're actually the, the outer counties uh, around New York City. Let's just click on one of them and see what we get. Average household, medium household income, $120,000 a year. 104, let's look at another county really quickly, a click on that, 117. So, you know, this is just another way to look at that. Um, it, the, the rate was already there for you in the table and um, you could um, actually just choose that and it will map it for you. So a few things you can do there. Um, I do wanna show you one thing. If there is a map that you've made, come up here and you really like it and you wanna keep it, you know, this is here for you to use. It is not copyrighted. You can come up here, you can grab that URL. If you can see this, you just sort of click on it, you right click, you copy, and you paste it into something. And then when you come back to it, like it's a PowerPoint or a Word document, it will open this map for you. Okay, so that is just one thing you can do with that. Let me just go, I had a couple of little things I just wanna show you. Let me go back to my filters over here on the left. So I could do a couple of different things, right? I could come back here, I could work with my filters all the time, or I could click up here on the census logo. If I click on the census logo, it clears out everything for me. Okay, so I will show you how to do that again. Let me just, 
and we're back to square one. And like I said, just start an advanced search. Come down here, year. You do want to select your year first, 2020, okay? And this time I'm, I'm going to say topics. And oops, I don't want topics. I want survey, American Community Survey, five year data profile. And I come here to geography. Let me just show you how to get something at a track level. You can come here to track, and we know that around the country, not always true, but tracks are maybe be, maybe about 4,000 people in a track on average. So I'm selecting New Jersey, Essex County, where I live, and I say all census, census tracks in Essex County, New Jersey. I come down here to the lower right, and I click on the search button. Okay, and it gives me these things right here. And right now I want to look at selected housing characteristics. So if you didn't know about this, American Community Survey asked, I believe, about 74 questions. And we ask a lot of questions about housing units. So here we have all these things about housing units. Are they, how many you know, bedrooms? Uh, when were they built? How many rooms? Um, I think, you know, type of heating and fuel when people moved in, how many vehicles, who knew, right? But today I, what I want to do is look at built 1939 or earlier, and look at this. It's going to give me a number or percentage, okay? So I'm going to come over here to the right, upper right, click on the mapping icon. And when you do that, it really just will select the first variable in the set. It, it doesn't, it's just, a, you know, it doesn't really do much, but select the first thing. So you have to come here and you have to control it. So let me just click on the variable button right there. And let's scroll down. So we're looking under uh, year structure built, right? And I want to look at right here, the estimate. So we're going to look at how, how many units were, well, actually let's look at the percentage first, percentage of the total number of units in that tract. So percentage built before 1939. And so here it is. Let me just zoom into that a little bit. Okay, and the reason I'm doing this is I, I want to show you, so here's a percentage, you know, over here, the lower, uh, the western part of the county somewhat, the percentage of units built be, be, before 1939 um, is high, right, uh, relative to the number of units in the tract, okay? But I could certainly come back here and look at the estimate, and it might look slightly different. So the estimate is letting us know that up here, actually, not really relative to the number of units in the track, but actually the number of units themselves might be, might be higher. So you can sort of look at things different, and I urge you to fool around with this. You can click on it, and we'll give you the number. right there, and it sort of highlights, it depends on how you want to look at things and the services that you, you need to, in, um, to give in that part of the county or whatever you are looking at. So just a different way to map. Don't forget, you can come up here, you can change your data classes if you wanted to, the number, the way you've done it, you can change your colors, that sort of thing. Okay, one last thing, I will go back to filters. And I'm going to, I think I'm actually going to just clear everything out. So let me go up to the logo. Okay, and so I thought this would be an interesting thing to look at a different way. Advanced search year 2020. And so up until now, we've been, you know, talking about ACS data. Um, and so I thought, it, you know, we might do something slightly different than those DP tables. Um, maybe we'll uh, go to the 2020 data, right? So let's see if we can find survey. Here it is, decennial census right there. And we're looking at redistricting data like that, right? 
And then I'm going to come here to geography. Okay, and I could do a couple of things. So I can, I'm actually going to um, look for census tracts. And I'm going to come down here to New Jersey. And I will look at Hudson County, New Jersey. <clears throat> and I will say all census tracts. Okay, and then let me just say search, lower right. And then these are the tables that are available right now for decennial census, right? So we have all these sorts of things. And I'm going to just look at this one right here, Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino by race. All right, so it's showing me this table. These are for all the tracks in Hudson County, New York. I don't know, if, I know this is a national webinar. So Hudson County, New York is to the, just over the Hudson River in New Jersey, west of um, New York City. So I'm actually looking for something that would be this right here that says Hispan not Hispanic or Latino. And notice I only get hard numbers. There are no percentages for the with the decennial census, okay? So right now, let me click on the map icon. And this is my last my last demonstration. So, you know, if you were thinking of a question, you might want to, you know, queue it up right now. Okay, these are all the census tracts in Hudson County, New York, right? And it sort of just as a default and map the first variable in um, that data set, but I really want not Hispanic or Latino. Okay, and then this is kind of interesting, so it sort of mapped it for me, right? But I can come up here and classes. And actually, let me let me change the color a little bit just to make it more interesting. Sometimes I find that if you're mapping different things, if you if you're going to keep them, if you if you give them different colors, it might help you figure out what your it might help you remember what you're mapping. So one one last thing, classes, we have natural breaks, but let's look at the equal interval. Okay, and I thought this was really interesting in this area. If you can see this, look at this now. There is only one, there is one lonely track right here. And look how huge it is in population where people are not Hispanic. And I found that really, really interesting. And this is a track that's an area, um, I believe it's called, oh, I forgot the name of the area, Pavonia. Um, Newport and Pavonia, it's on just west of uh, Wall Street in uh, New Jersey. So here's one tract right here. There's a huge amount of people who are not Hispanic. Let me just click on it. 9,674 people in a tract who are not Hispanic. And that's not even a total population of everybody in that tract. So that is quite a telling, I find that a telling story. I mean, I, I did, you know, I advocated for choropleth mapping that you should use rates and things of that sort. But here, look at this. Um, just, the, just the numbers themselves are telling you a story. So, okay, I, I am actually finished. Let me, uh, I'll stay here in this, in this, um, the Census Bureau website in case anybody wanted me to, to, I don't know, stump the host or anything like that. But I'm here to answer any questions if anybody has any. David, we've got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of themes um, about sharing the maps, downloading them, um, in a, a JPEG or downloading and printing or downloading with the color scheme and symbi uh, symbology associated with those maps. And also, um, one, is there, um, is it possible to embed the maps into another website so that others wouldn't have to click the URL to view the map? Perhaps yeah, that, I, I, I yeah, so people have asked me that question before, some of these questions. As far as I know, right now we cannot embed that. 
Um, I, I've been asked that before, and I, I did not find that we had the capability to do that, um, unless somebody's working on it now and they're going to spring it on me next week or something. But right now, I don't think we have that capability. But, hey, all my colleagues who are listening today, that's something we need to take back to the, the people who are developing this site. Um, the other thing is I don't think you can download this as a JPEG. What you could do um, is simply copy. Well, it's not going to give you all the information, but if you just wanted the image and, and the legend, you could you know do a screenshot and put it into a PowerPoint or something of that sort and use it that way. So I, I, am, I do apologize that it doesn't have more capability yet, but um, we're always working on this, and it seems like every month we're making little tweaks and, and upgrades to this website. So maybe just please be patient and keep coming back to the website and, and trying to see if maybe we will have that capability. Okay, on that vein, um, can we download it into an ArcGIS map? No. I'm sorry, you can't do that either. Yeah, we yeah we don't have that at the moment. We don't have that capability. You can download the data, right? So you can certainly come up here if you can see my screen still. Um, if we went back to the table, and you have to go to full table. If you already have the shape files, you would download them from our geography website. Then you would download this table, and you would have to um, match it. Uh, match it up there and then pick out the data as you needed. Two words of advice. If you download it into um, ArcGIS, um, you want this to be in Chrome when you're working in this system because Chrome is the one that will give you the uh, geo IDs. And then when you're downloading it, you look at your, um, your, your um, table. The geo IDs are not at the beginning, they are at the end of the table. So they will. As you're reading across, you'll see the GOID at the very end. Okay, and another question that seemed to reoccur was about um, providing the maps for um, accessibility, screen readers, color blindness, et cetera. How, how can we make the, or are these maps accessible um, for um, screen readers. Okay. So that I don't know. I don't know what a screen. I'm not really, you know, I don't know much about screen readers. But for color uh, blindness or are color blind, um, these the the hues or the colors that are here. Okay. Let me see if I can go back to map. Are actually based. Um, on the colors that are developed in what's called Color Brewer. So notice that there's a progression here. And so what I would tell you is, if you were to take this map and print it out in color, and then you put it on Xerox, and you Xerox it in black and white, you would see that there is a, there's a progression. Whatever this color is, whether you can see it or not, there's a progression of lightness to darkness, and that is, um, a reason to stay with one hue um, and to work from lightness to darkness and probably not too many colors, probably four or five colors. So that would be kind of a way around the color blindness uh, conundrum, I'll call it, or even color deficiency. So personally, I have a, a little bit of a color deficiency. So this system does work for me. Okay, so it's you're going from light to dark hue. It's when you when you start intermingling too many what we call hue, you know, from one hue to another that you could run into problems. Uh, that's it for my answer, Carol. Okay, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. One more real quick. Um, can you map by uh, zip code? Yes. You can you can map by zip code. I don't know if you want to want me to do that, but uh, let me just show you where it is really, really quickly. I'll go back to filters. Um, I, you cannot do it, as far as I know, for decennial, but you can probably do it um, for um, for ACS. Let me just do that really quickly. Uh, twenty twenty. Look at more survey. Let me go back year. Survey, 
American Community Survey five year. I'll just I'm, I have to click on a topic really quickly, and then you can come to geography right here, and I'm going to go back to the beginning of geography yeah, right here. Here it is. Where it is? Right there. Okay. And so here it is right here, zip code tabulation area. It's not quite the same as zip code. Um, we construct our zip code tabulation areas by census blocks, but you can certainly do that, and they are in here um, by state. I'm going to tell you the truth, and, and you have to go through, and you can take all of them, or you can go through and select them as you see fit. Zip codes are not really contained or nested within states, so many areas around the country we have rural areas, we have zip codes that are partially in one state and partially in another state. And so I, I do think you should be aware of that if you are mapping it, okay, just, just to let you know. That's it. That's what you would do, zip, zip codes. Correct. Very good. Thank you so much, David. Um, mm -hmm. Noemi, do you see any other um, thematic questions you'd like to share? I'm scrolling through the chat now, but I think David has covered everything. There was some questions about map aesthetics, best and worst practices. David, if you want to touch on that quickly in the time that we have. Um, I know it's a, it's a loaded well, topic. It is. <laughs> um, well, I guess I would, you know, I, was, I wanted to actually turn on my video and I can't figure out how to do it here. Oh, here it is. Maybe it'll start. You tell me if you can see me. Okay, I just figured, you know, I want to be a real person here and that you can see me. So I guess I would say, you know, don't don't overload your map. You know, don't don't turn your map into um, overkill. Keep it simple. Uh, so you know, one color per one subject. Um, try to you know try to make your map graceful. Try try to make it a little bit elegant. Meaning, uh, don't. You know, you don't want it to be uh, overloaded. Okay, so you don't want, I don't know, you don't want the 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 uh, serving of tortilla chips with too many things on it, like cheese and blah, 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 blah. You want, you want to keep it simple. So it's probably better if you're going to map three different subjects to have three different maps, but to keep them rather simple. Um, you would be surprised people, I always like to say people have a hard time reading maps, not your average person has difficulty reading maps. So um, you know, keep it as simple as you can, and that, that will help you with it. Very good. Thank you so much, David. Okay. Any other questions? All right. I guess I'll take it back, David, now. Okay. All right. <laughs> All <thanks>. right. <laughs> Thank you so much, David and Carol and Noemi. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was great. I'd like to right now thank everybody who played a role in today's webinar, and, of course, thank you, the audience, for spending the time with us this afternoon. I want you to please take a moment to fill out the evaluation uh, by following the link that we provided to you in the chat. We hope that you let us know not only what we can improve on, but what you enjoy from the session. Um, look out for the recording and the PowerPoint presentation on Census Academy by visiting census.gov academy. And we also wanna remind you of our next webinar in this series, your Community by the Numbers, Ancestry, and Foreign-Born Populations on Thursday, March 31st at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That will bring us to a close, so we thank you again, and we hope you have a great afternoon. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.